Southern California. Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. We have a jam-packed show for you all as, first of all, Happy New Year to everybody. Hope everyone had a safe New Year. Hope everyone is safe and sound as 2022 is here. The Chargers came up big as they stomped on the Broncos and Justin Herbert made a little bit of history as well. Now they got to take on the Raiders in a win-in-your-in matchup. And the Rams scrapped by the Ravens, but they're not NFC West champions yet. But they do play the San Francisco 49ers this weekend. as It's going to be a tough matchup, but we'll see if the Rams can come out on top. And how about UCLA and USC men's basketball getting back onto the court after Uncle COVID decided to crash the party and both teams picked up wins. And the Lakers, have they picked up steam? Or is this all for a smoke show? All that and more here on the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. This is Taron Rodriguez bringing you another edition of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show here on iSports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. And what is up, what is up, what is happening, everybody? This is your boy, Taron Rodriguez, bringing you another edition of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. Thank you for joining me on this beautiful Friday afternoon. Hope you are all having a great day. Hope you all are having an amazing new year. It's 2022. Let's make the new year a great one. Let's make it one to remember and not have a whole lot of sadness. Without any further delay, let's get on into that Southern California sports action. But first and foremost, we have a word from our sponsors. The first sponsor for iSports Radio is the Southern California Warriors Semi-Pro Football Team. The world of semi-pro sports is unlike any other sports organization. Players pay to play in hopes of so many different outcomes, whether it's playing to get filmed to trout for professional teams, big-time colleges, or just playing to stay in shape. No matter what, all semi-pro players have one thing in common, and that's playing for the love of the game. The SoCal Warriors have been on a quest to earn titles and give players second chances since 2017. Whether you're in Southern California or anywhere in the world, give semi-pro sports a chance if you love your sport. You may get the second chance you have been waiting for as an athlete. You can follow them on Twitter at SoCal Warriors, on Instagram at Southern California underscore Warriors, and on Facebook by typing the words Southern, then California, then Warriors. The second sponsor for iSports Radio is Background International Background Check International Businesses. Are you looking to background check a new hire on? Let Kit Fremen take care of that for you. Kit has founded and managed Background Check International. National since 1994 it is here to help you with the screening process. Contact Kit and let them help make the hiring process that much easier. This business is used for professional background checks and not for the use of any other uses such as identity theft or illegal activity. They do not have Twitter or Instagram, but they do have the Book of Faces, aka Facebook, as they have their little Facebook site. BC, background check international dash BCI and I sports radio is on Twitter and on Facebook at I sports radio and on Facebook by typing the word IE sports and then radio. Also background check international businesses has their own website, www.bcint.com. 
Also, for iSports Radio, they have their own website, www.iSportsRadio.com. And when you go there, you will check out you can check out their Patreon link, which has five different tiers. Because for the past seven and a half years, iSports Radio has been bringing you amazing content, ranging from interviewing legendary athletes, other authorized media personnel, and even coaches, to building tailor-made shows dedicated to all major sports cities around the country. All the while, iSports Radio has continued to be by the fans and for the fans. And with your help, we are ready to take the next biggest step. When you go to iSportsRadio.com, you will see the Patreon link with five different tiers. The first one starts out at $5 a month, which gets you a shout-out from all 32 of our shows. Higher tiers include iSports Radio merchandise, access to our podcasting university, IESRU, and even a chance to be featured on The Defining Moment in a segment with Larry B. Thank you, everybody, for making iSports Radio what it is today, and thank you for helping it make it your direct feed for all that is sports. And a big shout-out to iSports Radio's Fan of the Month, Chris from Massachusetts. He is a big Buffalo Bills fan. He's also a fan of the Buffalo Sabres, and I imagine he's a fan of the Buffalo Bulls. So... That big shout to Chris from Massachusetts, and also a shout out to our Patreon supporters, Bay Area Raised Apparel and Marcus Los Great. Thank you too for helping keep the lights on. As we say hello to Gina G in the chat room, she says, Have a great show. And Amanda J, aka AJ, as she says, Have a great show as well. Thank you, you two. So now let's get on into the Southern California sports action. I'll try to make this not too long of a show considering I've got plans, but it's what a, it, is, it is what it is. But So we'll get into the Rams first. So, unfortunately, I didn't get to see all of the game because I had a blackout this past Sunday, and I was missing most of the Rams game. And long story short, the Rams were actually getting beaten by the Ravens, who were not starting Lamar Jackson. Yes, Lamar Jackson has been out with an ankle injury, and unfortunately, the Ravens have kind of been suffering for it. But Tyler Huntley looked pretty solid. Like, he, if he was on, he probably can get a chance on another NFL team if need be. So, Tyler Huntley looked pretty solid. Matt Stafford did not, as he threw a pick six in the first half. This was bef- and he also, I think he also threw two, he threw two interceptions in the first half. And keep in mind, this was in the first half. I didn't get to see most of that first half just because I had the blackout. But I was getting updates via Twitter, and I was also getting updates on the ESPN Sports Center app. So there was that. But the Rams were down 10 nothing in the first quarter. It was looking pretty disastrous. It looked like it was going to be 14 nothing, but fortunately for the Rams, their defense stepped up. And then, fortunately for the Rams, Tyler Huntley threw an interception with less than two minutes remaining. And eventually Stafford found Cooper Cup for the touchdown, but they left too much time for the Ravens as they're able to get Justin Tucker in field goal range. And Justin Tucker has the foot, as always, as the Rams went into halftime trailing 13-7. Now, if they were leading, Rams fans would probably not be panicking, but they were, and I too was panicking. I was like, "Uh uh-oh, looks like the Rams are going to blow this one. Then the second half kind of started, and it looked as if the Rams were struggling. They eventually got the ball, but then Stafford decided to fumble it, which, oh boy, I I could not believe how, I I can't believe how not so good Stafford is playing. I get it, it's on the road, and Baltimore's a hostile environment, and same with Minnesota, but you can't have back-to-back bad games, like, and expect to lead the team to the Super Bowl. Like, I was even saying on the SoCal Supreme Sports Show Twitter account, this is the guy that's going to help lead the Rams to the Super Bowl? If that's our guy, then boy howdy, I am not looking forward to it as a Rams fan. But fortunately for the Rams, they started to get together a little bit by a little bit. Like, it, they started playing better. Unfortunately, they didn't score, but they limited the Ravens' offense as... The Ravens led 16 to 7 going into the final quarter. Then the Rams finally got a, another touchdown in the second half as Sony Michelle scored from 1 yard out and and then I was hoping and then I was basically saying Rams defense has to come up big. And then eventually they gave up a a big run to I think Devontae Freeman. Amanda says Stafford is still Stafford. Yep, 
That is true. Those are facts right there, Amanda. And she knows because she's a Vikings fan. Definitely do check out Frozen Takes, by the way. Anyway, so for the Rams, they were fortunate to hold Baltimore to a field goal as basically it was a long drive for the Ram- for the Ravens. And the 34-yard field goal was good from Justin Tucker, obviously, as they went up 19-14. to I'll give the Rams defense this. They came up big on third down. I think it was like third and goal, and eventually they got a sack. I think it was Aaron Donald that sacked Tyler Huntley. It was either him or Vaughn Miller, but fine. But the Rams did come up big, and basically the Rams had had little – they didn't have too much time to deal with as – he basically had to go – he had to basically march the Rams down the field. And fortunately for Stafford, he did get – he was able to convert a big fourth down, even though the Rams were very predictable in running it with Sony Michelle. As it was like third and one, and then eventually Michelle tried to run the route outside, and then he got sacked – or he got dropped for like a loss of four. And then fourth down – Mr. High-end talent Odell Beckham Jr. was able to come up with a big catch, get the first down, set up first and goal, and eventually Stafford went back to OBJ for the score, putting the Rams up 20-19. to Unfortunately for the Rams, their two-point conversion failed. But I will, get, I will give the Rams credit. They tried to lateral it, and I think for most teams, that would have fooled them, but... When it came to the Ravens, I think they're just a little too wise for that. Fortunately for the Rams, their defense came up big as Aaron Donald and – oh, no, actually it was Vaughn Miller got the uh, third down – got the sack with like less than 15 seconds remaining. And the Ravens tried to lateral it one last time, but then Aaron Donald appeared from behind and just punched the ball out, and that was GG no re. So the Rams did win that game, and surprisingly, their newcomers came up big. <laughs> Amanda says, Kirk Cousins, Stafford, oh no, Gina says, Stafford will never win a Super Bowl. I'm just saying. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. I, I can agree with that from a non Rams perspective. And unfortunately, <laughs> Amanda says, neither will Kirk Cousins. That's a little harsh. <laughs> oh, but I kind of agree with that, unfortunately. Uh, poor, poor Vikings. So, back to the Rams. Unfortunately for the Rams, they didn't clinch the NFC West because the Cardinals, to my surprise, def- well, not really to my surprise, they defeated the Cowboys 25-22. to Nice little volleyball score right there. <clears throat> but, um, I was surprised to see the Cardinals actually defeat the, the uh, Cowboys. But then again, Kyler Murray has not lost at AT AT&T Stadium. I should have actually remembered that, and I kind of forgot, and then I realized, oh, wait, that's AT&T Stadium is where Kyler Murray goes into Super Saiyan mode. So, unfortunately, the Rams are still one game ahead of the Cardinals for that NFC West spot. As Week 18 brings the Rams to their final game of the season, as they will return to SoFi to take on the 49ers, while the Cardinals will be returning home to take on the Seahawks, which we don't care about. <laughs> so, I, I for the Rams, they cannot afford to uh, bank on the Seahawks defeating the Cardinals. So... It's going to really be tough for the Rams to defeat the Niners just because they have not had the best of luck against the 49ers. I don't understand, but then again, I guess certain teams have their kryptonite. Like, take, for instance, the Chargers against Bill Belichick or the Chargers against Mike Zimmer coach teams or the Chargers playing at the Broncos. So for the Rams, back to them, they face a tough 49ers team. The 49ers are also scrapping, trying to scrap their way into the playoffs. In order for the 49ers to make the playoffs, they either need to win or they need a Saints loss. The Saints play the Falcons on Sunday, which the Falcons have been a roller coaster. Sometimes they've given their fans hope. Sometimes they've just let their fans down. But 
I think for the 49ers, they're going to also need to bring it just because, for starters, the 49ers are fighting for their playoff lives, and they have a good team. Like, on paper, the Niners have a playoff team, but unfortunately, injuries and then unfortunate losses have kind of really hurt them, but they're in a position to make the playoffs. But the Rams are also in a position to win the NFC West and be the number two seed, which would be ideal because then they wouldn't have to face Green Bay until the championship or the NFC championship. And Gina says said it best. She says, the tricky thing is which QB will play. And that is, that's the, that's the million dollar question for the Niners. Jimmy Garoppolo has owned the Rams. I don't think the 49ers have lost a game whenever Jimmy G starts at QB. If he can't go, as I think he has like a thumb injury. Yeah, it's a thumb injury because he can't throw the ball perfectly without his thumb. If Jimmy G cannot go, then it'll be Trey Lance who will be going in at quarterback for the Niners. So Trey Lance had himself a solid game against the Houston Texans. Rolls eyes. But um, it's the Texans. I can't really give too much credit, but Trey Lance did what he needed to do. And obviously Trey Lance... Trey Lance is, to me, I think deserved a little bit better. I think he deserved a few more reps and not like... I understand they have Jimmy Garoppolo and he has veteran experience, but I think they could have used Trey Lance a little bit more. But I digress on that. So for the Rams, they're going to need to stop the run game just because Elijah Mitchell and even Debo Samuel has been uh, has been running rampant. As Jimmy or Gina says, Jimmy has been doing well in practice, and the 49ers Twitter, Twitter has been in an uproar. They want Trey to play. And Marcus Vita- Vitel says, Texans, Texans have played some tough games this year, though. Yeah, it's true. I think the Texans are probably one of the more competitive sub-500 teams. Like, they, as well as the Lions, are the best sub-500 teams out there. Or at least in terms of, like, being competitive. So... But for the Rams, they really need to slow down that run game, and Matt Stafford really has to cut down on his mistakes. He cannot, 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 cannot afford to throw interceptions because he threw interceptions on the first two drives of the Rams and in the first meeting between the 49ers. And also, the 49ers had that long 11-minute drive in which eventually... That was basically what set the tone in the game. So Stafford has to limit the turnovers. They have to get Sony Michelle and Cam Akers involved. I am hearing that Cam Akers is most likely going to play, make his season debut after he tore his Achilles in the offseason. I can't believe he was able to come back from that. that. That's crazy. But I guess his timetable was worked out for the Rams and worked out for Cam Akers. So all the while, I think the Rams definitely have a chance. But again, the 49ers, it's just so tricky to predict this matchup. Like you never know what you can get with the Rams. Like sometimes the Rams will be elite and then, and then sometimes they'll just be, they'll just fall flat on their face. And that, and I guess Akers is, is an if he returns. I guess he's not he's not designated to return yet, but he is making progress. So the thing that does matter for the Rams is that they are in the big dance. So regardless is if the so regardless of if the Rams win or lose, they'll still be in the big dance. But it's not a matter of if they'll play in the playoffs, it's who they'll play in the playoffs. And Gina does make the good point that Emmanuel Mosley is returning. And I did see that. I did see that Emmanuel Mosley is playing on Sunday, which is huge for the 49ers defense. I don't know. It just seems that the Rams are just going to have to – they're really going to have to step up. Like this is basically – their their playoffs have officially started. And even though this game won't have too much of a groundbreaking impact for them – they, if they want to avoid facing the the Packers in the NFC in the in the divisional round, they have to 
they have to play their complete game. They have to play their most complete game. They already did so against the Cardinals, but then again, the Cardinals didn't have J.J. Watt and D-Hop, so yeah. For me, I think the Rams will win, but it's going to be very close. I did say that I'd pick the Niners on Gina's show, but I think the Rams are able to – will possibly squeak this one out. I'm just trying to be as encouraging as as possible for the Rams. I think the Rams have what it takes to beat the Niners. It's just that they seem to get off to such a horrid start. And I think the Rams are a little bit better than they were – back when they played the 49ers the first go-around, just because the Rams had finally reached their point of they are facing the big threat teams after they defeated the Houston Texans. As they lost to the Titans the first go-around in that gauntlet, and they lost to the Niners, which was kind of expected, but not really. And then the Packers was a lost cause. And then ever since the loss to the Packers, the Rams have actually... They've turned it around. I know the Jaguars game doesn't count, but the Cardinals game was impressive. And then the Vikings win was somewhat impressive. And then the Ravens win was also somewhat impressive, considering the Ravens were also fighting for their playoff lives. And it came down to the final minute of the game. And Gina says if the Niners lose, it's on Shanahan. That's true. I mean, Shanahan could be fighting for his coaching life or his coaching job security and whatnot. And players are fighting for their job security. But I think the Rams come up big. I don't want to pick against the Niners, but I'm picking the Rams to win 24-20. I think that's a little bit respectable. I Now, do I think... Cooper Cup will get the record for receptions and receiving yards? I don't know. I actually don't know because he needs 12 receptions to surpass Michael Thomas's 149 in 2019, and he also needs 136 receiving yards to surpass Calvin Johnson's 1,964 receiving yards in 2012, which would be a single-season record. So... I don't know. I think Cooper Cup will have somewhat of a big game, but he won't break the receiving yards record. Gina says Niners win 34-24. I think it just, it's just going to get decided by one score. I think this will go down the route of the Chargers path, a.k.a. this has to get decided by one score. I, I think it would just it would be quite fitting for both teams to fight to a one-score game. It, lots on the line here. The 49ers are trying to fight for their playoff lives while the Rams are trying to bolster their chances of being the two seed as well as win the NFC West. The Rams can finish as high as the two seed, but they could finish as low as the five seed, which if they were the five seed, I imagine they'd play the Cardinals in the first round. So there's that. Gina also says that Debo Samuel breaks the 1,000-yard record. I could see that. I imagine that's that's receiving yards and not like all-purpose yards because I'm pretty sure Samuel has a thousand all-purpose yards. So, but I think it's going to be a great matchup regardless. And whether the Rams win or lose, they could take away lessons from that game and apply it to the up-and-coming playoffs because. I think for me, the Rams are still a team that no one wants to face. And I think the NFC is kind of up for grabs as I don't think Green Bay is as invincible as everyone thinks they are. And then Tampa isn't – and then the Rams still have their flaws with Stafford. Then you have the Bucks, who are nowhere near perfect, especially with Godwin being out and them being somewhat banked up. And then you have the Cowboys who – kind of go Peyton Manning without the rings as I see you in the chat room, Larry. I, I see you. I'm getting to that eventually, but I'm just wrapping up the Rams here in the NFC. So, um, back to the NFC, the Cardinals aren't as perfect as most people thought they were, but they are getting back JJ Watts and possibly Deandre Hopkins. Then obviously the Cowboys, are they always go Peyton Manning mode in the playoffs without the rings. And then you have the Eagles, which are in the playoffs, but 
it they're, they're kind of hot and cold with Jalen Hurts. And then you have the 49ers, which, which I think can be a dark horse in the postseason, but they have to get to the postseason first. So there's that right there, and... And then if the Saints get in, then I'm pretty sure they'll be one and done. But I digress. Larry says, Raiders suck, but hey, we're still relevant in Week 18 this season rather than our usual when we're basically eliminated by Week 3. <laughs> they were actually 3-0, and and they, were, they actually went – the Raiders actually went 3-0 and to – for the first time since 2001 when they won the Super Bowl or they went to the Super Bowl. And, uh, yeah. All right, so that's actually a perfect segue to go into the Chargers. So the Chargers actually showed up to play, and they just dominated the Broncos. Now, the win against the Broncos isn't overly impressive just because the Broncos were missing quite a number of players. They didn't have Jerry Judy, COVID-related, they didn't have Bradley Chubb, COVID-related, and they didn't start have their starting quarterback, Teddy Bridgewater, who had a concussion. So they decided to start Drew Locke, and they had to start Drew Locke just because he was their best option. Early on, actually, Drew Locke actually got hurt. I think he suffered a shoulder injury, and then he went to the locker room. So Brett, I think his name was Brett Ripon. He came in for a little bit, and he took over. But all in all, it was basically just all Chargers. And, yeah, Gina I, Gina in the chat room, saying back in, she says, at least the Niners own the Lambs. Yeah, nice little little observation, but are they in the playoffs, though? Have the Niners locked up a playoff spot? I don't think so. <laughs> uh, Larry and Gina are just having fun in the chat room but back to the Chargers they basically stomped on the Broncos and I give credit to the Broncos they were kind of fighting for their playoff lives but without most of their key players and with the Chargers having all of their players or most of their players it was basically just a a beat down against the Broncos. And Justin Herbert actually made history in that win over the Broncos on Sunday. So he actually surpassed the single season touchdown record for the for the Chargers as he surpassed Philip Rivers' record back in 2008 with 34 as currently Herbert has 35 so far through 16 games. And I think that's impressive considering Herbert was able to do that within 16 games. Now, if he did that in 17 games, there might be a little asterisk just because 17 games back, 17 games didn't exist back when Philip Rivers was playing in 2008, while Justin Herbert had 17 games to work with in his season currently right now. So, all in all, it's really impressive that Herbert continues to blossom, and he currently has 71 passing and rushing touchdowns, a.k.a. pass all-purpose all touchdowns, as he, as the passing touchdowns are the most by any player since Dan Marino within the first two seasons of a career in NFL history. And then Justin Herbert also has 8,197 passing yards through his first two seasons, which is actually the most by any player through the first two seasons. So basically, Justin Herbert continues to blossom and he's only getting better. And he's actually, I think he's third in passing yards behind Stafford and Brady, which I have mixed feelings about. Herbert being behind Matt Stafford, but I digress. Like, he probably could have had more passing yards, but I think that Broncos defense is underrated, and as a, if they're 100%, the Broncos defense is better than what most people give them credit for. So, but this isn't about the Broncos. This is about the Chargers. So, all in all, the Chargers are still in the playoff hunt. They actually moved up to the seventh seed, but they aren't in the playoffs just because eight, seven, 18 weeks and 17 games rolls eyes. So this week the Chargers take on Larry's Raiders as they'll be hitting the road to Sin City to take on the Raiders at Allegiant Stadium. The Raiders surprisingly defeated the Colts 23-20 to 
on the road, which I was actually kind of surprised to see that happen just because the Colts have been on somewhat of a tear and Jonathan Taylor has just been a beast of a running back. The thing is for the Raiders that they actually became the first team to beat the Colts despite Jonathan Taylor having over 100 rushing yards in a game, which is downright impressive. I really think that's very impressive, and Derek Carr didn't even need to throw for over 300 yards, which the Raiders are actually getting better when it comes to doing that, as it used to be whenever Derek Carr throws for over 300 passing yards, then the Raiders win, but if he throws for under 300 passing yards, they lose. But the Raiders are getting better in terms of that whole thing. So for the Chargers... This is going to be a big challenge, just because the Raiders and Chargers have the same record, and whoever wins goes to the playoffs. The loser, unfortunately, stays home. So for the Chargers, they really have to step up. This is the game they have to like be strong in, and the Chargers could have definitely avoided this had they just taken care of business against the Texans. But they had a multiple players out with COVID, even though I'm not using that as an excuse. And they also had other games where they probably could have won. They should have and probably could have beaten the Cowboys. They probably could have beaten the Patriots and probably could have beaten the Vikings, even though the Vikings are a better team than most people give them credit for. So... For the the Raiders, they have to slow down the running game. They actually did a very good job of slowing down the Broncos' running game in Javante Williams and Melvin Gordon. And they really came up big in the red zone. The thing I will say about the Chargers is they have to come up big on third down defensively. They're one of the worst third down defenses in the league. And the Chargers against the Raiders are basically going to be a bloodbath. The Raiders actually thrive on third down. I think the third down is the Raiders' money down, and that's when Derek Carr mostly comes up big. They also have to get pressure on Derek Carr as well, just because Carr has actually been impressive this season. I can't believe I'm actually uttering those words, but this is no knock on Derek Carr. Like The poor dude's been through quite a bit and a lot of criticism, but for for Derek Carr, this is his chance to prove the naysayers wrong. And believe it or not, Larry and I actually had different – we didn't have like different takes, but we had different finishes for our teams. He had the Raiders finishing second in the AFC West with the Chargers right behind them, while I had the opposite. I had the Chargers finishing second in the AFC West while the Raiders were right behind them in third. So the funny thing is is that – Someone on NFL Network, Adam Rank, actually predicted the Broncos to finish second in the NFC West while having the Chargers and Raiders in third and fourth, respectively. And we all know how that turned out. It didn't. <laughs> so so uh, back to the Raiders and Chargers. For the, for the Chargers, they also have to make sure Justin Herbert does not make any mistakes that that offensive line has to make sure he has time in the pocket just because whenever Justin Herbert does not have an interception or a fumble, the chargers are undefeated whenever he now, obviously Justin Herbert has made mistakes in the past. He obviously has had an interception and there have been a few games where the chargers have won set AKA the Steelers and the Bengals. They won those two games but more times than not, when Justin Herbert does not make a mistake, they're undefeated this year. So so they also have to get the run game going with Justin Jackson and Austin Eckler. And they also their, – their receivers actually have to catch the darn ball. And the defenders, whether it's corner or safety, they actually have to catch the ball as well. Everybody has to catch the freaking ball. Derwin James had – Two possible interceptions that, unfortunately, he could not corral. The first one, he caught it, but he was out of bounds. And the second one went off his chest and fell incomplete. So Derwin James has to come up big in that regard. And they also have to make sure Derek Carr feels uncomfortable. Derek Carr can scramble, but if he gets pressurized, he kind of gets scrambled. His mind kind of gets scrambled, and he... 
basically sometimes makes mistakes. Like, Derek Carr has not been the perfect quarterback, but he certainly has not been the worst quarterback. He's actually been very impressive. And the fact that the Raiders, despite everything they've gone through, whether it was with Henry Ruggs, John Gruden, and most recently Nate Hobbs, the Raiders are still in the spot to actually make the playoffs. And it's darn right impressive. And also the passing of John Madden has kind of ignited a fire. I had this weird feeling the Raiders would come up big against the Colts, and considering they were playing with heavy hearts for John Madden. I just didn't think that the Raiders would win on the road and whatnot. I, and against a hot Colts team, it's really impressive. And I know Carson Wentz isn't the best quarterback. He obviously makes mistakes, but... The fact that they won despite Jonathan Taylor rushing for 100 yards. Yeesh. So, for me, this is kind of reminiscent of week one. Or not not week one. Week four when the Chargers and Raiders played. Considering the Chargers had to face the Raiders who had won three in a row back in week four. And now in week 18, the Chargers have to face the Raiders having won three in a row. Now, looking at those three wins, the Raiders beat... A Browns team which was starting a majority of its backups due to COVID. Then they also beat the Broncos who started Drew Locke. And then they also beat the Colts, which I think that was their most impressive win. The Chargers, on the other hand, their last three games have ended in a loss to the Tech uh, nah. A loss to the Chiefs, which they probably could have won that, but unfortunately didn't. A loss to the Texans, which was downright unacceptable. And then a win over the Broncos, which the Broncos were not full strength. This one is going to be very close. I would not be surprised if this game had to be decided in overtime. But I think the Chargers win. I have them winning. What's a respectable score for this, for both these teams? I say they win 31-27. I think the Chargers just barely come out on top. I I think it's going to be a one-score game regardless of who wins or who loses. I'd be surprised if the Chargers won by more, or I'd be super surprised if the Raiders won by more. But this is the game where the Chargers need to come up big. They have to. I understand it's on the road. I understand there's going to be a blackout in in Allegiant Stadium. But I'm also just going to throw this out there right there. This is the the chance for the Chargers to lock up their spot and prove that they are one of the AFC's best. And they have potential. Like, they can hang with a lot of teams. Like, other than that Ravens game, which was a complete lost cause, (laughs) and other than that Broncos game where that was also kind of a lost cause until... Well, actually, no. The fourth quarter was a lost cause. And, uh... Until, But the first three quarters were kind of close. And for me, I think the Chargers as a whole, as long as they have most of their players and they're on the same page, they can get the job done. Larry says the Raiders are going to win 31-28. That's a good score, honestly. I think that is a, a respectable score right there, and I don't knock it. I think that's – I was going to say 31-28, and I probably would say 31-28, but then again – I think maybe the Chargers hold the Raiders to the point where they have to kick two field goals and and whatnot. And then the Chargers, in my opinion, they have to have everything going correctly. And Justin Herbert, like I said, he has to basically play a clean game. The offensive line has to keep his jersey clean. They actually did a pretty good job against the Broncos, albeit they were missing Bradley Chubb. And once again, the Chargers did a really good job against the run game against the Broncos, but now they face a somewhat challenging Raiders team. Although Josh Jacobs hasn't been the best running back for the Raiders this year, he does have that talent and he does have that burst, and they just cannot afford to underestimate the Raiders. This is and Larry says this is the Raiders Super Bowl. I think this is kind of the Chargers Super Bowl as well. This is basically both teams a Super Bowl, and basically this is your win and your in. I just don't want to see both these teams kneel kneel the entire game and then eventually end in a tie. I don't think that's a good idea. Just because, let's say, let's actually say hypothetically, the Jags beat the Colts. 
<laughs> if that happens, then boy howdy. Um, let's say the Jags beat the Colts, and let's say the Raiders and Chargers tie. If that happens, then the Raiders and Chargers are both in, the Steelers are out, the Colts are out, and more importantly, the Ravens are out. But but that would ha- but they would have been out if the Steelers had beaten the Ravens, which is possible. But if the Chargers and the Raiders both get into the playoffs, then the Raiders would be the seventh seed and the Chargers would be the sixth seed. And that would entail the Raiders most likely playing the Chiefs in the first round, while the Chargers would most likely play the Bengals. Now, this is most likely, this isn't set in stone, but this is kind of my projection, just because I have a feeling the Bengals will beat the Browns, considering I I feel the Bengals are going to be starting everybody just because they still have a chance for the one seed. And the Titans, I could see beating the Texans. They're most likely going to be starting everybody to lock up the one seed. And then the Chiefs are obviously beating the Broncos just because the Chiefs are going to start everybody and they're not going to hold anything back because they also want that one seed. And then I guess I should also make note that I have the Bills winning the AFC East as I have them beating the Jets. If they lose that match, then they need to reevaluate that team before playoff time. And I guess I'll just throw this out there. I have the Patriots beating the Dolphins. But all of that has nothing to do with Southern California. (laughs) I'm just saying it does have something to do with the Chargers, though. So that's going to do it for the NFL portion of this show. I will say this. um, This has been an exciting NFL season. I want to see both the Rams and the Chargers in the postseason and it would still keep the hope of both LA teams possibly playing in the Super Bowl alive, even though I don't see both those teams make it all the way to the Super Bowl. Woo, Nelly. I don't think that's going to happen. But if that happens, then cool beans. So that's going to do it officially for the NFL portion of the show. Let's jump on in to some NHL action as the Ducks and the Kings are still at it as the Kings are... They still remain in sixth or fifth place in the Pacific Division, though they are only one point behind Edmonton, and they're, they actually have the same number of points as San Jose, which is pretty cool. But as for the Kings' most recent games, last night, aka Thursday, they lost to the Nashville Predators four to two. But then last Saturday, they beat the Philadelphia Flyers by a football score of six to three, which. I guess is cool. <laughs> and then on the final day of the calendar year, well, actually, no, they, they didn't play on the final day of the calendar year, but they did beat the Canucks two to one in a shootout. So, so tomorrow the Kings are playing the Detroit Red Wings at the crypto.com arena or something like that. I still think it'll be, st- I think I still think it's Staples Center regardless, but The Kings play the Red Wings at home on Saturday. Then on Monday, the Kings play the New York Rangers at home. And then the following Thursday, the Kings play the Pittsburgh Penguins, which will be the return of Jonathan Quick, which will be quite the homecoming. And then next Saturday, the Kings play the Seattle Kraken at Seattle, which should be a fun match. I want to say the Kings and the Kraken have not met one another this season. I am 95% certain the two have not met one another this season. If I'm wrong, then so be it, but I don't think I've seen Kings versus Kraken once this week, once this season. And they haven't played. So, next Saturday is the first meeting between the Kings and the Kraken. So, cool beans right there. As for the Ducks, they are still in second place in the Pacific Division. They have had a couple of tough losses, and their matchup against the Detroit Red Wings, which I think was scheduled for today, is now postponed to Sunday, which I guess is cool, but it is what it is. They're actually, you yeah, know, they were actually supposed to play yesterday, and then the game got postponed and is now moved to Sunday. So for the Ducks this past week, they defeated the Philadelphia Flyers 4-1 to at the Honda Center, even though I think that should still be the Arrowhead Pond. And then this past Sunday, the Ducks lost to the Avalanche 4-2 to after they led 2-1, to which was absolutely disgusting. I almost wanted to hurl after seeing that loss. Like, 
it was just disappointing. And then also the Ducks lost to the Golden Knights 3-1, to which was a complete lost cause. I think that loss actually occurred when I was live last week. So uh, that's the team that the Ducks cannot afford to lose to, especially the Golden Knights. With the Pacific Division being how it is, that race is getting a little tight. The Ducks are four points behind the Golden Knights. They are still in second place, and I give the Ducks credit, but they have to tighten that grip on second place, if not get to first place. Please. Anyway, the Ducks will stay at home to take on the New York Rangers on Saturday. Then the following day, the Ducks play the Red Wings. Then on Tuesday, the Pittsburgh Penguins come to Anaheim to take on the Ducks in a battle of the birds. And then next Friday, the ducks will be hitting the road to Chile, Minneapolis to take on the Minnesota wild. And then I guess I should make note of this next Saturday. The ducks are hitting the road to take on the Chicago Blackhawks, AKA Adam Carnick's Chicago Blackhawks, which should be a fun matchup. So all the while the ducks have been consistent this year. I'm surprised they are still doing well. I know a few of their matchups have been a little bit bumpy, but Thank goodness they beat the Flyers because the Flyers have been quite the train wreck this season. This is no offense to the Flyers, but they're, they haven't been good. And if the Ducks lost to them, then I would have probably thrown a fit and I probably would have been screaming like a banshee in my neighborhood. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I would not do that. Meanwhile, the Kings are actually starting to pick up ground here. They're actually doing better than they were previously. They were... I think they were in 7th or 6th place, but now they've jumped to 5th, and they are closing in on Edmonton. Like, the Kings still very much have a pulse. It's just that they have to yes, have to start coming up big as, once again, the Kings... The Kings and the Ducks have definitely improved, and I can kind of see them beating the Red Wings, even though Detroit is a very good team. Well... Very good, but not great, honestly. In terms of divisions, the Red Wings, or as one of my friends once called them, the Dead Wings, the Red Wings are fifth in their in the Atlantic division, which I guess is pretty solid. It's not bad, but it's not great. And then the Rangers are going to be ever so tough just because they're actually the fourth best team in the league entirely. And then the Penguins are obviously the Penguins, and that's going to be an emotional night for all the Kings fans and Kings players. So that's going to be quite big right there. So that is that for the NHL portion of the show. Definitely do check out the Neutral Zone every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Pacific time, 9 p.m. Eastern with Adam Karnick and Zachary Puplis. They both do an excellent job with with their hockey. They hit all topics of hockey, which is absolutely awesome. Now let's jump on over to the NBA, and then we'll take ourselves a quick little commercial breaky break. So, believe it or not, and I'm actually quite surprised this is happening, the Lakers are actually doing solid. (laughs) I never thought I'd be saying those words, but the Lakers have actually won three in a row. Their most recent game on Tuesday, they defeated the Sacramento Kings 122-114. to Then this past Sunday, the Lakers outlasted the Minnesota Timberwolves 108-103. to And then to close out the calendar year, they were able to take down the Portland Trailblazers 139-106. to They stomped on them, man. Woo! But then again, the Trailblazers have kind of been having a not-so-good season. So this week, well, from now all the way till I go live, the Lakers are back at it in the crypto. The I I don't even know what it's called. It's like isn't like the crypto. dot com arena. I still think it should still be Staples Center. I am so angry. Yeah, crypto. dot com arena. Like I will never call it the crypto. dot com arena. I will most likely call it Staples, just because it should be Staples. I don't care what anyone says. The fact that they changed Staples Center to crypto. dot com arena makes me so angry i already let out my frustration last year aka last calendar year and when i dig up that sound bite you will see how passionate i am anyway so the lakers tonight they play the atlanta hawks at home in a nationally televised game at 7 p.m pacific time which the hawks 
have just as been disappointing as the Lakers. Considering the Hawks have so much talent on that team of theirs, and to everyone's dismay, the Hawks have kind of been underachieving, despite all the talent they have, such as Trey Young. This is obviously going to be a fight to the finish when it comes to Trey Young and LeBron James. Lakers don't have Anthony Davis, but they're actually doing better without him for the time being, which kind of makes me think that if AD gets back to full strength, or hopefully when he gets back to full strength, hopefully, the Lakers will be better and they'll be improving on their record. Like, currently, the Lakers are 20-9. and nine. They are over 500, which I never thought I'd see the day that would happen. It's a Christmas miracle, ladies and gentlemen. So anyway, back to the Lakers. This Sunday, the Lakers will stay at home to take on the Grizzlies. Then on Wednesday, the Lakers head up to NorCal to take on the Sacramento Kings. And then I guess it's fair to say that Next Saturday, the Clippers or the Lakers will be taking on the Denver Nuggets, a team that's also trying to find its footing in the Western Conference. Currently, the Lakers are the sixth seed, which is darn right impressive. They're making some progress. They're not making too much progress, but they're making some progress. They actually lead the Bron- not the Broncos, the Nuggets by one and a half games, which is actually no, just a half a game. They lead the Nuggets by a half a game. But there's still plenty of season remaining. Like between the Mavericks all the way down to the Clip or to the Timberwolves, it's still pretty much tight within that within that aspect. It's just that one through four with the Suns, Warriors, Jazz, and Grizzlies, those are basically the teams that are your top four and will most likely have a home playoff game come playoff time. But we're looking too far ahead. So that's the Lakers right there. For the Clippers Let's just say life has not really been all that great, especially with Paul George still being out. They did have a good win to start the season, but their past two games have kind of been somewhat forgetful. Yesterday, the Clippers got drubbed by the Phoenix Suns, 106-89. to Now, that game was actually closer than it appeared to be, as the, the Clippers actually were only trailing by, I think they were like only down like four or so, four or six, going into the fourth quarter, just because they had themselves quite a big third quarter, as they're actually down by nine going into the fourth quarter, which is actually not as bad considering they trailed by 16 at halftime. But then the fourth quarter occurred and Phoenix flexed its muscle and basically torched the Clippers. Monday was also a forgettable game for the Clippers as they lost to the Timberwolves 122-104. to Absolutely disgusting right there because they were down 18 at halftime and their leading scorer was Serge Ibaka. That just goes to show that the Clippers were just straight up behind the eight ball for sure. So I'm sorry, but that was basically how the Clippers fell behind. And they just couldn't recover against the T-Wolves. On last Saturday, however, the Clippers did beat the Brooklyn Nets 120-116. They're actually trailing most of that game, and then they actually rallied courtesy of Eric Bledsoe. So that was good stuff right there. They even put up a 40-burger in the fourth quarter, which I was very impressed I actually was highly impressed with the Clippers and how they were able to rally back and get that win, considering they trailed by as many as 13, but then they just started to surge ahead in that fourth quarter. And they even did well when it came to shooting the ball well, despite their free throws being pretty much less than average and then them getting out-rebounded. That was pretty disgusting right there. So there was that game right there as the Clippers also ended the calendar year with a tough 116-108 loss to the Toronto Raptors. So currently, the Clippers stand at 19-20, and which is one game back of the Lakers. They are currently the 8th seed in the Western Conference, as the Pacific Division has four teams making the playoffs possibly. And heck, m- maybe, maybe. I was going to say maybe all five teams can get in, but... That would entail that the Suns are the one seed, the Warriors are the two seed, the Lakers are the six seed, the Clippers are the seven seed, and the Kings are the eight seed, in which the Kings, they're not even in consideration of making the playoffs. So they are borderline of San Antonio's coattails, but I digress. So, 
for the Clippers going forward from now all the way to the next time I go live. Saturday, they take on the Memphis Grizzlies, which that has been the hottest team in the NBA right now. The Grizzlies have... I want to say they've won like seven or nine in a row. I want to say it's... They're winning... Yeah, seven in a row. The Grizzlies have won in a row. And honestly... That team looks legit. John ja Morant is the real deal. And then Sunday, the Clippers take on the Atlanta Hawks, which I think that team is better than what their record indicates, but they are not using that talent correctly. Then on Tuesday, the Clippers stay at home to take on the Nuggets, and then the Clippers will be hitting the road to the Bayou to take on the New Orleans Pelicans on Thursday. And then next Saturday, the Clippers will be taking on the San Antonio Spurs in San Antonio. So... There is that for the Clippers. And I was actually going to go to a Mavericks game with my brother. I was actually, I don't think I told any of y'all this, but I was actually planning to go to Dallas, Texas to visit my brother. But unfortunately, due to bad weather with like snowstorms and whatnot, those plans have kind of been caught in an icy crevice. So there's that. Disappointingly, but. It is what it is. So that's going to do it for the NBA portion of the show. Let's take ourselves a quick little commercial breaky break. When we come back, we got some NCAA men's basketball to talk. And we also have some news regarding LAFC as they now have hired a new skipper to lead their team. Who is he? You'll have to find out after the break. You are listening to the SoCal Supreme Sports Show here on iSports Radio, your direct feed for all that sports. We'll be right back after this. What's up, sports fans? Are you looking for the latest on Northern California sports? Then take a trip out west with me, your host, Gina G, on Reppin' the NorCal Sports, right here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. I'll be bringing it to you all the way live every Monday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. And it's always a packed show. I'll bring you everything. Dynastic 49ers. The bite of the San Jose Sharks. Torture of the San Francisco Giants. The Golden State Warriors that we still believe. Then take you across the bay to the rise and grind of the Oakland A's. I've got you covered on college ball from the Cal Bears to the Stanford Cardinal, so that no matter what, reppin' the NorCal sports is always reppin' the Bay. So if you bleed red and gold, or you're looking to keep an eye out west in them thar hills, don't miss me, Gina G, on reppin' the NorCal sports. Catch me every Monday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, and I'll have your fandom repped harder than a trio of Defenders Garden Stephen Curry before his buzzer beater is Gucci. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Davidson. It's your boy, the entire lot. And we are the hosts of Fast Break here on IE Sports Radio, where we discuss everything in the world of basketball from prep to the pros. You guys definitely check us out, man. Sunday 
8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. We got all the basketball information you guys need, so we look forward to you guys listening in. And please do, because we are the best basketball show on this side of the Mississippi. And please do check us out on Twitter at FastBreakISR. D-Lock, where's our time again? 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. That gives you guys plenty of time on a Sunday. Tune in. with segment number two of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. I appreciate everybody tuning in. Big shout out to Gino G, Larry B, and Amanda, who is in the chat room. Gina says she loves Fast Breaks music. I do, too. I think it's very soothing, and it's just calming and relaxing, and I like it. So before we go on, I do have to give myself a mini Dumb Dumb of the Week award just because I forgot to live... I forgot to retweet slash quote tweet the live link as I promised I would on the Twitterverse, and unfortunately I did not, and I lied. And I think I also talked a little bit in the introduction, so I gotta give myself a mini Dumb Dumb of the Week award because of my mishap. You're so dumb. You are really dumb. For real. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was my bad, everybody. I'll take the Dum Dum of the Week award, or mini Dum Dum of the Week award, just because I broke my promise. I need to make my promises. I can't afford to break my promises, y'all. I'm a man of my word. I'm a man of the people. Thanks, Gina. <laughs> she says I'm forgiven. <laughs> All right, so anyway, back to the second half of the show. So now we got to jump into some MLS news as LAFC has now hired its new, ma- its new head coach. They have hired – can we get a drum roll, please? So LAFC has hired Southern California native and U.S. Soccer Hall of Fame inductee Steve Shurindolo. And he is the second head coach in LAFC history, which is actually pretty cool. So I'm not the most knowledgeable soccer guy, but if he is a U.S. Soccer Hall of Fame inductee and he's a Southern California native, I think this is a good hire. Obviously, LAFC had an atrocious season last year where they were 95% out of the playoff picture, unlike the Galaxy, who were basically 99% in the playoff picture, and then they were out of the playoff picture by the final day. Gosh darn it. But this is a good hire for LAFC, and I hope it pans out. I would definitely recommend hearing the soccer scoreboard show with Andrew Hagenbaugh whenever it gets back. Because Andrew Hagenbaugh will have all your soccer information, and he will have the full the full news on this hiring. So I think it's a good hire. So I think LAFC will be fine. I think, unfortunately, last year they just had a bad year 
Which, but it's nothing winning can't cure, so we'll see if LAFC can get back on track. So now let's jump on over to some NCAA men's basketball. So in terms of USC and UCLA, they finally, finally, finally got back onto the court as yesterday marked the first game in almost a month as both teams returned to the court, as UCLA had the honor of playing Long Beach State for a second time. The first time Long Beach State played UCLA, UCLA won 100-79. As Pierre says, he likes the Churindolo hiring himself. I I'm glad I think I think it's a good hire as well. So back to UCLA. So Thank you for tuning in, Pierre. So back to UCLA and USC. So UCLA last night dominant. Well, they didn't like dominate, but they beat Long Beach State again. They won ninety six to seventy eight. It was the first game that UCLA had played since December eleventh of last calendar year. Which, boy howdy, that that must have been uh, that must have been brutal for uh, UCLA to just be stuck in COVID protocols as their last game was against Marquette, which was an impressive win on the road. So apparently UCLA's win over Washington is now going to be classified as postponed and not canceled. So it won't go down as a forfeit victory, but it is what it is. So back to UCLA and their current state. So they defeated Long Beach State, which it's a battle of two Southern California teams. I wouldn't have been disappointed on whoever won that. For Long Beach State, however, they actually had the same problem as UCLA did. They kind of were stuck in COVID protocols, but the problem was is that they weren't the ones really stuck in COVID protocols. Their opponents in the Big West Conference were, as their matchups against Cal State Fullerton and Cal State Bakersfield have been canceled due to the due to the Big West Conference's uh, conference policy. And then their matchup against Cal Poly got canceled. And then, unfortunately for them, prior to conference play starting, they were in COVID protocols for 10 days as their matchups against La Sierra, San Diego, and Hope International were all canceled, which was a complete bummer for Long Beach State. But they got back onto the court, and while they did not win it felt good to see them back onto the court. And they felt good being back on the court as well. And the, also another good thing about Long Beach State is that they actually covered against UCLA. I made that joke yesterday. At least Long Beach State covered. But compared this matchup to the first matchup, yes, Long Beach State scored one less point. But they had their moments when they looked sharp. They weren't as sharp as the first go around where last where the first matchup UCLA only led by three at halftime but for Long Beach State they just wanted to get back on the court and Mick Cronin was very complimentary to accommodating them because like Long Beach State UCLA wanted to get back onto the court as well and then I also should make note that Long Beach State also beat West Cliff which I want to say is an NAIA school, and I'm not, and they are indeed a, a, a an NAIA school. So Long Beach State has finally gotten back to the court twice, but this time they faced a Division One opponent, a true powerhouse, kind of their neighboring rival. The only concern I have for UCLA now is Jaime Jaquez's injury, as he came down on his ankle and he had that. He had that puppy wrapped up in ice, which, oh, man, that that's brutal for UCLA. They finally get back to the court. They finally get back after exiting COVID protocols. And then Jaime Jaquez gets hurt, which I don't know how big that injury is. I don't know how long he'll be out for. But if he's out for quite a bit, then that's not good news for UCLA because they had to deal with injuries last year and it affected their conference play and it eventually affected their conference record to the point where they unfortunately could not win the big or the Pac-12 conference. So, so for UCLA, they're going to UCLA. Their next matchup is against Cal and that's going to be Saturday. It's going to be on the road. They actually were supposed to play Stanford this week, but unfortunately COVID protocols, kind of got into the Stanford 
men's basketball program, which is uh, very unfortunate. Like, COVID has just been kicking the butt of every freaking league and every sport and every team. It's real. It's really frustrating. I'm sorry, but it is. So UCLA plays Cal on Saturday. Next week, hopefully these games won't get canceled. UCLA will head back to Poly Pavilion to take on Oregon and Oregon State. I'm looking forward to that Oregon matchup, even though the Ducks are not as good as they were last year. So we'll see what happens with that matchup. I think it's going to be a great matchup. It's going to be nationally televised, and I'm most likely going to be on the call for that matchup for USRN and then Wellington Sports Radio and all those other broadcasting stations of the sister stations of IE Sports Radio. But I digress. So that's basically UCLA in a nutshell right there. Staying in the Pac-12, we have USC, who also made its first appearance in almost a month their last game however was on december 17th when they played georgia tech but but just like ucla uncle covid kind of ran through their program like a bull in a china shop and unfortunately they had to postpone games they had to postpone their matchups against arizona state and i think they moved arizona as well I would have was looking forward to that Arizona matchup between USC and Arizona. And then also their matchup against Oklahoma State got canceled as, unfortunately, once again, COVID just infected the USC program. And unfortunately, USC could not reschedule that matchup. It got canceled because it's a non-conference game. Now, if it were a conference game, which heaven forbid if it was, or if it was a groundbreaking game, then they would have probably rescheduled it. But since it's not Pac-12, then there's no need to reschedule it. It just really sucks because I was actually looking forward to that matchup, considering Oklahoma State was 7-3 and three at the time, and I think they would have given a big test to USC. So, USC last night returned to the court to take on Cal. This was an 8 p.m. Pacific start time game. Like, that is a big, fat oof. oof. Especially for those on the East Coast, by the way. <laughs> so for Cal and USC, USC actually – I actually saw this game entirely. I was actually on the call for this game. USC looked solid despite having not nearly played in over a month. So for USC, they didn't really struggle all that much. They kind of had a tough time putting away Cal as – Cal got within – they got as close as four points, but they never got any closer as Isaiah Mobley was just the strong the strong dog of the law as he had 19 points and 12 rebounds. Like that dude is legit. And also Drew Peterson had himself a game with 17 points and he also had nine rebounds as well. I think USC – one thing that USC has going for them is their height. They actually are pretty tall for a – they're not as tall as they were last year, but they have lots of big bodies on that team. They have Isaiah Mobley, Chavez Goodwin, Isaiah White. His energy really sparked the Trojans. Max Engblank Polo is pretty solid when it comes to his height as well. I really think USC has a solid team. Now, do I think this team is Pac-12 championship caliber worthy? Ah, that still remains to be seen. But USC does have a promising squad. They were selected to finish third in the Pac-12, but their true tests are going to be on the horizon as USC is only one of three undefeated teams, the others being Baylor, the reigning national champion, and Colorado State, which I'm a little surprised they're undefeated as well, but what do I know? <laughs> so Stanford was supposed to be USC's next opponent, but unfortunately Uncle COVID has made its way into the Stanford men's basketball program. So that game is postponed. However, it has been moved to Tuesday at 2 p.m. Pacific time. So that's basically USC's next game. USC will also play Oregon State and Oregon next week. But both of those games will be at 8 p.m. So if you're on the East Coast, I feel bad for you. <laughs> and then it's also brutal for the West Coasters just because – well, for starters, it's an 8 p.m. start time. Who wants to go to a game at 8 p.m.? Like, not me. I'm not a big fan of those 8 p.m. start time games. But if I have to, like, broadcast them, then so be it. 
But USC takes on the Oregon schools, and then they also take on Stanford next week. Their true test will be against Colorado just because they have not had a whole lot of luck against Colorado. Like, Colorado has pretty much been their kryptonite. I don't understand. Like, it makes zero sense that this – that Colorado continues to own USC like it's nobody's business. It, it, it's so mind-blowing. It's, it's like the opposite of football. Like, normally in football, USC owns Colorado, but in men's basketball, it's vice versa, which is gosh darn impressive. So – We'll see what happens in that matchup. That's not for another couple weeks. So I look forward to seeing USC and Colorado, though. It's going to be a fun little matchup. And then, but like I said, next week is a big week for USC in terms of number of games. That Oregon game looks very appetizing. And I think, to me, I think Oregon could could challenge USC and or UCLA but it all remains to be seen. And then Stanford also looks like a challenging opponent as well. I mean, obviously the record is 8-4, and four, but I don't think it's to be underestimated. Like, we haven't really seen the full throttle of the Pac-12, as the only one that's really played a consistent Pac-12 schedule is Utah, which no one's really afraid of Utah. I'm sorry to say, but... And then we also have to see what Arizona has to offer just because Arizona actually suffered its first loss over the Christmas break as they lost to Tennessee. But they did get back on track on Monday as they defeated Washington 95-79. to So they, as well as USC, are the only undefeated Pac-12 teams remaining. So there is that little tidbit right there in terms of the Pac-12. And that pretty much does it for college basketball talk in Southern California. Also, UCLA is 1-0 in Pac-12 play, but it's 1-0. We're not overly excited about that, are we? Not really. (laughs) Okay, but that's going to do it for the NCAA basketball portion of the show. So before, before we get a move on, we have to give out the Dumb Dumb of the Week Award, except not really. I'm not going to give out a Dumb Dumb of the Week Award just because it's the start of a new year, and also we need this fresh start. And I don't think anybody deserves the Dumb Dumb of the Week Award after the first week of the new year. So no Dumb Dumb of the Week Award this week as I'm going to send you all on your way. Psych! There will be a Dumb Dumb of the Week award, as if you all have been paying attention to my Twitter, I saw something very, very face-palming on Monday. I think it was either Monday or Tuesday, but remember last week when I said no one needs to assume anymore? Well, someone already broke that promise. So... I was reading something on ESPN, and ESPN had their power rankings of all the NFL teams. And me, being the Chargers fan that I am, I did not care about the other – oh, I guess the Chargers and the Rams. I didn't care about the other 30 teams. All I just cared about was the Chargers and the Rams, I guess. And then I just scrolled down to number 15 where the Chargers were. And the Chargers were currently number 15, and that's not the reason why I'm giving out Dumb Dumb of the Week award. The Dumb Dumb of the Week award goes to the writer who decided to write this. So the Chargers' New Year's resolution was redo Justin Herbert's contract. So this is what I give Dumb Dumb of the Week award to. So she writes, this is Shelly Smith from ESPN. I know Herbert is in the second year of his rookie contract and rules are rules, but his base salary this year is $1,818,125. He certainly won't starve and it and will get paid big time in his second contract. But still, it seems low for a quarterback with a shot. Now, this is the this is the part. This is the part where I basically have to. I, where I basically have to give out the Dum Dum of the Week award to. So, here is what I give Dum Dum of the Week award to. So. Shelly Smith writes, it seems low for a quarterback with a shot of leading his team to the quarterback. Yeah, it seems low for a quarterback with a shot of leading his team to its first playoff berth since 2009. 
Let me read that again. It it seems low for a quarterback with a shot of leading his team to its first playoff berth since 2009. First of all, that part is incorrect. The Chargers' last playoff berth was not 2009. It was 2018 when they wound up finishing 13-3. and I thought I made myself perfectly clear for people to no longer assume. I think it was 12-4 and actually that the Chargers made the playoffs, but still. Why are we assuming that the Chargers last made the playoffs since 2009? They're not that bad. They even made the playoffs back in 2012 or 2013. Regardless, I am infuriated by this. I don't understand. Why are people still assuming to this day? To this day! What? What? As a Chargers fan, I took that personally to heart. I was like, what did I tell y'all about assuming? No more of this assuming in 2022. She just broke the rule, and now I got to hand out this Dumb Dumb of the Week award to her. And I'm not one to hand out Dumb Dumb of the Week awards to writers just because I'm a journalist myself. But Shelly Smith, for you assuming that the Chargers, my team, the team that I will forever love despite how many times they break my heart, no matter how many times they decide to punch me in the McNuggets, no matter how many times they lose winnable games that they should win, you, Shelly Smith, are this week's Dumb Dumb of the Week Award recipient. And you are th- this week's Dum Dumb of the Week Award for the first time in 2022. You are so dumb. You are really dumb. For real. <laughs> <laughs> And that, my friends, is all she wrote. We're still assuming to this day, we're, we're now assuming teams last making the playoffs. I'm pretty sure everyone caught that, and I'm pretty sure they've made the correction. But when I first read that, it's like, how do you mess that up? Go back, check your sources, you have Wikipedia. Use that! <laughs> Before the inner Charger fan in me gets bursted out onto the scene, that is going to do it for this week's episode of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. Uh, Let's all make a pact. No more assuming anything. (laughs) I know it's 2022 and nothing is guaranteed, but one thing that is guaranteed is... Please don't make mistakes like that. Please don't make silly mistakes or do dumb things. No more assuming anything. Well, without any further delay, it's time we get on out of here. Because I got business to take care of. You dig? Thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody, for tuning in to the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. I appreciate you all tuning in. Big shout out to the chat room. Gina G, who is going to be getting inducted into the iSports Radio Hall of Fame very shortly. Larry B was in the chat room. Pierre Moss was in the chat room. Amanda J was in the chat room. I appreciate you all tuning in. I appreciate everybody that listened. If you listen in the wee hours of the morning, I appreciate you. If you listen live, I appreciate you. If you listen on the playback, I appreciate you. If you listen at work, I appreciate you. If you listen in the hail or the rain, I super duper appreciate you. I appreciate you if you listen to this no matter what the situation was. Hopefully I will be back next week. I'm just hoping because nothing is guaranteed. I will let you all know, but SoCal Supreme Sports Show is here to stay along with Set Point. And without any further delay, for everyone here at IE Sports Radio, this is Taryn Rodriguez signing off. You all have yourselves a great weekend. Don't do dumb things. Don't assume anything. Please be safe. I don't mean to say this, but if you aren't vaccinated, please get vaccinated because Uncle COVID is here to stay. We cannot have any more sports getting shut down. And just do your best to try to help slow the spread. Y'all have yourself a great weekend. And remember, SoCal is for SoCal. Peace!